Warm Militant and philosophical greetings to everyone here today. I'm Justin, and allow me to welcome everyone in attendance to the first leg of the Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom lecture series on Marxism and philosophy. This event is part of the Appearing Core Group's Philosophy Month, the annual student-led festivities of the University of the Philippines Diliman Department of Philosophy, with this year's theme being Pilosopo ng Bayan, Suriin at Baguhin ang Lipunan. Before we begin, let us recognize our partner organizations who helped make this event possible. Philosophy Month 2022 is brought to you by the Bicol University Young Philosophers Society, the League of Filipino Students CSSP, UP Kabataang Delos Batasho, and Hilagio, the University of Santo Tomas Senior High School Philosophy Club. It's also in cooperation with La Societe, the De La Salle University Senior High School Philosophy and the Philippine Collegiate. Also, we are in cooperation with the Philosophical Society of Philippine Normal University Manila and the UP Philosophy for Children Society. Now, to deliver the opening remarks and introduce our lecturer, let me call on Timothy John Larana, Philosophy Department Representative of the CSSP Student Council and convener of the Aperon Core Group. Hello, uh, good morning to everyone and um... Welcome to our lecture series. Um, first off, I would just like to thank uh, everyone who attended and everyone uh, from the Appear and Power who uh, um, introduced and not only introduced, just uh, enrich and uh, discuss or open um, avenues of uh, discussion for uh, what uh, we advocate for a uh, nationalist scientific and uh, mass-oriented uh, culture, and uh, especially in philosophy, given that uh, what we currently practice in the department is uh, primarily uh, in the analytic tradition. So we want to in introduce uh, new, new angles or new um, avenues for our, uh, our fellow students and also introduce um, other people who might be uh, affected by the onslaught of the red tagging uh, committed by the NTF LCAC uh, under the Duterte administration. So um, without further ado, to introduce our uh, lecturer for this afternoon, he is a professor from the Department of Philosophy of York University in Toronto, Canada. He is the author of several books on philosophy, such as Continuity and Rupture, Demarcation and Demystification, and critique of Maoist reason. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Joshua Mukawad Paul. Hi, uh, <clears throat> thanks for having me here. Um, just uh, you know, a bit of an apologies in advance. Um, it is you know uh, 10, 10 p.m. here um, after a, a weekend where my my wife and I and kid were were, were visiting family, and so I'm a little bit in a, a kind of a, <laughs> a tired headspace as the evening advances, but I, I'm gonna do my best to, to, to be as clear as possible. I mean, if there's, if there's moments where the clarity seems to lag or the rigor seems to lag, uh, please bring that up in, in the question and answer period because um, that might be just because I'm moving through things too quickly and because when I'm tired, I tend to, tend to speed up a little, a little bit. Anyhow, I'm going to begin my talk. And you know, the talk that I'm talking about and, and what I was asked to talk about was, was to address um, the, the main subjects of, of my book, Demarcation and Demystification, which was a book interested in discussing the meaning of, of Marxist philosophy. But in order to do that, I also had to, of course, uh, you know, discuss the question of what is philosophy in general. And I'm sure as many of you know, the question, what is philosophy, is a question that philosophy as a discipline has been concerned about for a long time. And connected to that, right, that this, this question of what is philosophy is something that we have been you know, concerned about for a long time. We also have, for those of us that define ourselves as Marxists as well, this connection, connected question of, of what is Marxist philosophy. And that's one that Marxist philosophers have been also concerned about for as long as there has been Marxism. And my book, Demarcation and Demystification, 
was an attempt to think through those interrelated questions. So in this talk, I'm going to be summarizing some of what I covered in that book. It's not an exhaustive summary. I mean, it can't be, but I'm gonna to try to highlight uh, the main areas uh, that, that, the, that the book covered, the main terrains. And if there's any questions that I, I have to move quickly. So I'm gonna be like probably leaving a lot of holes so if there's any questions about the holes I leave, I'd really like to address those in, in the question and answer period. And the book was also concerned with these questions, which I'm also gonna be trying to fold into this discussion. And these questions are the following, why does a definition of philosophy and Marxist philosophy matter? And what is the significance of philosophical practice, this idea of philosophical practice for a communist project? Or what does it matter to do philosophy if you're involved in some kind of revolutionary project. In any case, I'm gonna begin, of course, with this, this first general question of what is philosophy? So providing a definition of philosophy in general, it, it usually becomes part of it, you know, we first approach this, I guess, as students of philosophy, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I experienced this back when I was an undergrad as well. You first get this kind of discussion about it in an introduction to philosophy course, um, but maybe, many of you have experienced the same thing I experienced way back in my undergrad is that such a definition often is unsatisfactory. I mean, you come to this as students being like, I want to study this thing called philosophy because it seems so important and so cool. And then you're like, well, what is it? And, and you know, the, the professor in the intro course, um, they give different but related definitions that are, are usually quite quick. And most of the time, some of these de definitions, they move into a, a laundry list of philosophy subdisciplines. So it moves pretty quickly from saying, well, here's what I think philosophy is really quickly. And then they're like, but it's also, you know, ontology and metaphysics, epistemology, ethics and politics, logic, aesthetics, and all these kind of subfields that, you know, compose uh, philosophy. Um, and so when we have introductory courses, and you know, I'm, 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 thinking of, I'm thinking about this through this kind of introductory course notion of how philosophy is introduced to, to people that begin studying philosophy in university, because I've also taught a lot of introductory courses. Um, and in my grad studies, I was TA for a number of introductory courses. And there's kind of two ways they go about it, right? Um, one way is to organize the course according to the subdiscipline. So it kind of may provide this general definition of people walk out, well, this is what philosophy is, because I've been introduced a little bit to ontology and metaphysics, a little bit to epistemology, a little bit to ethics and politics, logic, aesthetics, right? Um, or, or it's organized according to some version of the, of the so-called great thinkers of, of the Western canon, right? And it starts, then in this way, it'll be that, that way of organizing, it'll be like, it'll start with Socrates, and then it'll move into Plato and Aristotle, and then you get some variation of canonized thinkers up to whatever contemporary thinkers the professor favors, right? And maybe if the course is a little bit more critical, it'll throw in stuff outside of kind of that Eurocentric canon. It'll throw in some stuff from Eastern philosophy or some stuff from African philosophy. But generally it just kind of goes up to these kind of, oh, here's a topic from this, here's a topic from that, here's these thinkers that we're, we're moving through. Um, at any point, what I'm trying to get at it is that these intro to philosophy courses um, tend to define philosophy after some vague generalities, right? By its characteristics and characters, and that is by its component parts. And the, the totality of which these parts are meant to form is barely addressed as if to avoid the fallacy of composition. So, I'm not suggesting when I, when I say that about intro to philosophy classes, I'm not suggesting at all that the question, what is philosophy has not been addressed in the history of philosophy, right? I noted at the very beginning that this question has concerned the discipline for a long time. And maybe many of you are aware that there is more than one book called what is philosophy out there, right? Or there's a variation of the title, what is philosophy? And probably all these books that are called what is philosophy or some kind of thing, a general definition of philosophy or what have you, probably all of those can comprise a, a library <laughs> in and of itself. Um, it, it's rather that the debate about the meaning of the discipline is such that it, take, it makes addressing this meaning in an introductory philosophical course somewhat difficult. The reality is, is that there could be an entire philosophy course just on the question of what is philosophy. And, and that might tell us something about philosophy, 
As I write in Demarcation and Demystification near the beginning, defining philosophy has always been a philosophical conceit. It's always been something philosophy has been concerned about. And that is because philosophy has always been concerned about these general sorts of questions about defining categories. And so, for example, if you find yourself in a course that is talking about the meaning of science, uh, science in general, or a particular science, then odds are you are in a philosophy course, right? You're not in a course that's actually provided by the sciences. You're actually probably in a philosophy course that's giving you that meaning. I mean, if you go into the sciences, they don't spend a lot of time discussing these debates about the meaning of what their particular science is. Or if they do, it's usually cross-listed with the philosophy course, right? Um, and that, that insight about you know, this idea of a meaning of different disciplines. I, I wanna bracket that for a moment um, so I can address the historical problematic that led to the disciplinarian notion of philosophy in the first place. And note here again, I'm gonna be glossing over a lot um, in the time that we have and uh, just, you know, kind of <laughs> providing uh, summaries of, of things I, I took a lot more detail to talk about in the book or that others who I was referring to talked about in more detail. And one problem here is that um, philosophy's kind of canonization into a discipline that leads the heterogeneous nature of those historical moments that have been canonized. And what I mean to say here is that unlike other academic disciplines, which came into being with the modern university, the, the academic disciplines we understand now and these kind of separate kind of you know, programs that you go into or departments, those came into being with the modern university, Philosophy has this long history of philosophers going back to ancient times. So much so that other disciplines often draw on these philosophers. And there was, as many of you know, a point of time where all of the contemporary disciplines were considered subfields of philosophy, right? The ancients, for example, were trying to do science and sociology and other pursuits as part of their philosophical metaphysics. And this was the case for scholars called philosophers uh, it, the ones that we see in the canon, right, right up until the European Enlightenment. And in that moment, right, there was a shattering of philosophy into a variety of different fields, and all these fields are now discreetly pursued, and yet philosophy as its own discipline remains. And a, for, a formal mark of this once unified notion of philosophy is that, is that we still call the mastery of these different fields a PhD or a doctorate in philosophy. So just to be clear right here, I'm, I'm not... What I, when I'm talking about this stuff about you know, philosophy and its fragmentation of, into different fields, I'm not lamenting some lost totality of scholarly knowledge. That's the kind of reactionary metaphysics that, that Heidegger and his kind promote, right? This <laughs> idea, and it's, I'm not interested in that at all. Rather, what I'm interested in is thinking this history so as to discover a, a kind of a particular notion of what makes philosophy its own discipline now following this history. I was gonna take these moments to have tea and my other things too. <laughs> I had to pace myself here. Um, so what I wanna do now is, is go all the way back uh, to when, in, you know, when philosophy emerged as something called philosophy. Again, in a very general way. Um, right now, I can only prefer, provide kind of broad brushstrokes, some of which you'll be familiar with, but I wanna kind of draw uh, uh, kind of some ideas out of that. And, and I'm mindful that I'm addressing the Western canon right now, or the canon that finds its origin in ancient Greece. And, and we should be mindful that ancient Greece was only West in retrospect. A lot of people have written about this and, and kind of the construction of the Eurocentric canon like made Greece like West. <laughs> and then they charted this whole thing out in order, you know, it's all connected to like colonialism and imperialism and that. And people like Samir Min and others have written about this. Um, but I'm doing that because, you know, we know that kind of we you know, find finding its origin in ancient Greece. This is where philosophy was coined as a word. And also largely this, this canon is what I'm the most familiar with, uh, since this is the tradition in which I was schooled and also the tradition which has such a hegemony that it is pretty much you know, predominant amongst so many universities. But, but I do think here based on conversations I've had with colleagues whose work is studying like different strains of philosophical traditions that were outside of this canon, that what I'm about, I'm about to say was kind of common the world over about the emergence of what we can call philosophy by the Greek name or by any other name. And what I'm saying here is following Althusser and others is that philosophy first emerges as its own discipline 
in response to religion, not necessarily in antagonistic response to religion, but in some kind of dialogue, sometimes antagonistic, sometimes non antagonistic, sometimes a mixture between the two. So let's look at the Ionian Enlightenment, right? Um, and this is, you know, a period that begins in 625 before Common Era. And that's where the word philosophy appears as a proper term. And the scholars of this period, um, like, you know, and again, I, I, I am mindful of the fact that I'm, I'm really generalizing here, but if we look at a number of the scholars of this period, we find that they dislike the fact that religious interpretations of reality, the religious interpretations of their time were inconsistent. And, and they wanted to find a way to make sense of the world that would be clear and consistent, unlike the contradictory claims made by priests and poets. You know, this is also the period where you find an obsession amongst these philosophers, these early philosophers, and the fragments of which, the, you know, of their, of their work that survives, with, with some conception of science, or what was called natural philosophy. The idea Here was to explain odds or, or theory attempting to either replace religion or become a foundation of religion, right? And this, of course, is going to lead to problems down the line, which I'll get, which I'll get into later. Then after the I Ionian Enlightenment, uh, you get Socrates. Um, and we're talking about like kind of, you know, there's more to that, but in terms of what we, what we get taught in introductory philosophy courses and, and how to understand the canon, there's Socrates, who, despite his supposed complaints in his trial, he follows in some way the footsteps of the Ionian Enlightenment by, by adding the dimension of critical dialogical engagement against the order of religious piety. And you can see this kind of rejection of that order of religious piety in, in his dialogue with, with, with Euthyphro. Following Socrates, uh, Plato and, and Aristotle inherit this attitude in different ways of the Ionian Enlightenment. I mean, a good example of this is, is Plato's claim in the Republic regarding the banning of poets. Um, and, and this is, you know, often treated as an attack on artistic freedom when people read the Republic in like English departments and things like that, because of the way that we understand the concept of poet now. And, and there is some relation to it, you know, Plato does talk about the problem of a representation of representation, but at the same time, the term poet meant something conceptually different in the time of the Ionian Enlightenment. Um, up until Aristotle, if not further than it does today, right? Like the, the poets, if they're like the poet had a social role in the ancient world. And, and that was to be a mouthpiece of the God. They were, they were seen as mouthpieces of the gods and they were the supposed human interlocutors of the divine. So in some ways, opposition to poetry in, in the ancient world was opposition to religion. Um, so what that which called itself philosophy was trying to do was replace the order of religion with the order of critical and systematic thought, or at least buttress that order with kind of the authority of critical and systematic thought. And because this critical and systematic supposedly shorn from religion, that is the pursuit of an ontological order meant to replace religion, right? You find that in like kind of Plato's theories of forms, all the way to all the different kind of grand metaphysical projects that move all the way up into the contemporary era, uh, which is why we have philosophers for a long time treating ontology and metaphysics as the basis of philosophical reasoning, you know, the supposed queen of philosophy, because what they were trying to do in that ancient world right up until the modern era was either replace religion or provide a second order justification for religion. Now, all of this, right, um, this, this kind of, this kind of ontology, ontologization that philosophy was doing at that time is in fact a process of remystification, right? It tries to, it, in some ways it's using critical thought to kind of demystify this kind of inconsistent religious order. But at the same time, it starts going into these talks of like being qua being and like, you know, what is, what is this nature beneath things? You get theories of the forms, you get like all that kind of stuff, right? And, and we find that philosophy emerged as philosophy in an attempt to demystify the religious world, but then generated its own mystification by setting itself up as the arbiter of an ontological order in various ways. Either by replacing religion and science, they were doing so with the intention of policing this line and giving philosophy the authority to decide the ontological foundations of thought. 
So through this history, then the question becomes, what was this thing that called itself philosophy doing? What can we draw from it that matters now? How can we think of it as a discipline after it was shattered into a variety of other disciplines? And it's kind of two quotes from people from different traditions here that you know kind of guided my, my thinking in this project in, in the book. Um, the first is from Wittgenstein who called philosophy the logical clarification of thought. And the second was from Althusser who defined it as the thinking of thought. And I, I tend to agree with these basic definitions from both the analytic and, and continental traditions because they are what remain as a constant from this troubled history of the discipline. And also they are definitions that explain what philosophy was always doing without falling into its authoritative philosophical decision. That is its claim to decide the ontological foundations of all thought. That is the practice of philosophy has been um, throughout all of its and in my PhD, I, I largely had to take analytic courses as well, um, studying some stuff in continental philosophy on the side. And, you know, my study in Marxist philosophy kind of like taking me into debates in, in both areas as well. In any case, one of the things that, you know, I, I, I take out and I still maintain and when I have to teach like stuff from the tradition of analytic philosophy is the importance of, of arguments and, 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 and reason. Right, with my, you know, stuff that I always have to discuss, and you know, with my with my logician uh, colleagues, uh, things uh, lacking a good ar argument are viewed with suspicion, and for good reason. I I, I agree, uh, because the lack of good reasoning leads to confusion, and that is a kind of a, a kind of a mystification in and of itself. Whereas precise and thoughtful arguments lend to clarification and kind of unconfusing things or demystifying things. The the intention of making things clear, which is really important. Right? Philosophy as a whole has always demarcated, always tried to think through problematics and draw important lines of reasoning and meaning in the hope of making sense of the world. As noted uh, in this, my whole discussion here about, about kind of this really brief discussion of, <laughs> of the history of philosophy, um, such practice can be drawn back into forms of mystification, can be remystified into these kind of ontological systems. Arguments and the instruments of reason, as we know too, they can also be used to justify the state of affairs and they can be used to engage now in what I call occultation, right? Like occultation is this kind of thing I talk about in the book and, and that is the attempt to build complex ontological systems that they occult reality because they claim they're, they're providing this kind of uh, under this, this, this scaffolding of reality as well, it's beneath uh, reality itself. Um, but both this justification of the present order and or ontological occultation still possess the kernel of clarification. I mean, first of all, we talk about kind of the justification of, of present orders and how it still possesses using this philosophical justification, this kernel of clarification, even though I suggest it goes wrong. We can look at Hobbes, right? I mean, Hobbes justifies the existence of the monarchy when he wrote Leviathan. Um, and that's a whole kind of using the, the, the ideology and the, his practice connected to a certain class, justifying um, the existing order. Um, and in the same way, when I, when I talk about how, um, you know, even, even these kind of processes of occultation that philosophy does, this kind of grand ontological projects, they also possess, possess possibly kernels of clarification. A good example here is, is, is Hegel, right? Now we know in one sense, Hegel's system is what you know, Feuerbach called it a speculative theology. Yeah, that's, what he, that's what he saw was doing at the end of the day, was providing, even though it was claiming his philosophy, he was like, it's theology at the end of the day, a speculative theology. But at the same time, it provided useful tools for Marxist philosophers. Um, and, and we know that both uh, Lenin and Mao read the logic, right? Before they worked on some of their most significant revolutionary works. In any case, it's here, in this basic notion of philosophy as the logical clarification of thought or the practice of thinking thought where we can begin speaking about Marxist philosophy. Now, moving into this question of what is Marxist philosophy, the best way we can engage with it is to begin as I did in demarcation and demystification with Marx's most famous quotation about philosophy, since it's the one that has been referenced by innumerable Marxist philosophers. And that's the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, um, in from thesis, the 11th thesis in Theses on Feuerbach. Um, and we all know it, 
right? Uh, I think we all know it. I'm maybe I'm assuming a lot. I'm gonna assume we know someone say it before. in connection with the other theses of that tiny document as points of contention with Ludwig, Ludwig Feuerbach's attempt at a materialist response to Hegel's idealism. So historically, they represent the moment that Marx was finally breaking from left Hegelianism, specifically its Feuerbachian strand, uh, and it served as an outline for the German ideology, which was actually a project that he and Engel, Engels would abandon and in their words, they, they left it to the judgment of the mice. So in many ways, there's this historical fact of this document that people love this quote, but it kind of was a preface for another project that was abandoned by Marx, right? Um, so despite that, despite the fact that it, Right, the idea of like trying to the importance of kind of thinking thought as well. The third, uh, despite giving too much to the role of the philosopher in initiating social transformation, notes the importance of philosophical partisanship, you know, the necessity for politically committed philosophers to choose a side. My position in all of this <clears throat> is that we should read the 11th thesis as suggesting that philosophy can only interpret the world, right? That it can only interpret the world. And that by itself, um, philosophy is a practice that cannot change anything. But if the point is to change the world, which is not something that philosophy or philosophers by themselves can do, then the role of philosophy is transformed. That is, once we realize that philosophy has only been a practice of interpreting the world, of clarifying the world, right? Logical clarification of thoughts, thinking uh, something Marx noted in 1845 when he recognized the supposed materialism of Horbach's philosophy uh, still functioning squarely within the mystified authority of philosophy qua philosophy. And beyond that, he and Engels also noted that a lot of these philosophers, what they were doing, despite making these claims about logic and reason, were justifying the bourgeois order, were justifying, and we can talk about other Marxists later on, talking about their, the, 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 this entire tradition of early enlightenment philosophers justifying settler colonialism, justifying imperialism, uh, and, and providing arguments to claim that these things were natural, justifying slavery as well, right? Um, so as much as it was leading this charge against the ancient uh, European feudal order, these enlightenment philosophers thought they were doing that. At the same time, they're providing like class, like justification from very clear class positions of the bourgeois order of their day. Marxism's effect on the tradition of philosophy then was to challenge, um, outside of challenging kind of the class commitments, which we are gonna get that too in terms of the practice of, of philosophy. And what I said earlier about the class commitments of philosophers. Um, but his effect on, the, on, on philosophy was to challenge the long-standing conceit of the philosophical decision, the preeminence of philosophy, this notion of this preeminence of philosophy, even when it was declaring itself materialist to make itself the arbiter of thought. Instead, we find Marx, despite his philosophical training, deciding that philosophy has a secondary role. So the point of philosophy as an interpretive practice is to logically clarify thought, or to think thought, which it always was, even when it pretended it was more important, which is why we also need to recognize that philosophy has always been a partisan tool or practice. And in this context of philosophy always being partisan, those who use its tools are dedicated consciously or unconsciously to particular class politics, even when they pretend they are not. Uh, the philosophical condition is conditioned by the political decision even if that political decision is unconscious. And here I'm gonna use an example, right? So I'm gonna use the example of, of the political philosophy of John Rawls. I mean, considering John Rawls uh, has been the standard of analytic philosophy. Um, 
And, and here we can see with Rawls how the philosophical interpretation is already an a priori conditioned by class politics. And just look at like, it, then go back to like every kind of, not every introduction to philosophy course, but so many that I've taught, or at least in a lot of undergraduate courses where you start talking about, um, you know, uh, like classes on, on politics, right? Philosophy, political philosophy, you encounter, you're, you're gonna encounter, um, or at least you did through my day, unless now it's been stuck to, Side, but I still know that in my department, we still teach it, right? But I, I want to suggest, and this isn't just my suggestion, it's a suggestion other, other philosophers have made, that it is in fact a partisan class gesture. So, I mean, you know the, the ins and outs of this thought experiment. You have these kind of agents are rendered ignorant of their social position and, and their, their job is to choose the just society and they don't know what social position they will be in um, uh, when, whenever they choose uh, in, in the society that they choose. And so Rawls says, well, what happens is they will naturally choose uh, 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 this, this, this situation that allows for both social advancement and a security net. What in effect they are choosing uh, is welfare capitalism. The way that Rawls describes it is completely what uh, this kind of welfare capitalism kind of conception looks like. Um, so despite the fact that Rawls claims this thought experiment is ignorant, or sorry, since have been conditioned by a partisan politics, the agents behind this veil of ignorance, they're, they're, they're actually already conceived of something and Rawls conceived of them as rational and self-interested, right? Um, and that in itself, that claim that these agents rendered ignorant of everything boiled down to their essential selves are rational and self-interested. That's a political claim. That's a claim that they're bourgeois subjects, right? Um, so why are these agents behind the veil of ignorance also not rendered ignorant of their bourgeois subjectivity? Why do they end up choosing a liberal variant of capitalism? or I should say a uh, social welfare variant of capitalism. Rawls' uh, interpretive philosophical gesture is, even though he doesn't admit it, a partisan gesture, and it's based on an a priori political decision. And my point here is that philosophers are always politically partisan, even when they pretend they are not. So philosophy is thus a partisan practice. It is, and this is what Marxism kind of teaches us, it is conditioned by class politics, and those philosophers who think they exist outside of such politics are deluded. Uh, but because of the history of philosophy, right, that took itself to be the neutral arbiter of knowledge as a whole, it is in fact common to encounter philosophers who imagine they are somehow outside of class politics. And you know, a reminder of me here is like I, I think what times like I, I'm you know I'm part of a uh, a uh, academic uh, labor union. Um, as contract faculty, and, and my labor union at York University has a history of being actually quite radical compared to other labor unions and going on strike quite a bit um, <laughs> into some very, very long term strikes uh, that, you know, are very vicious with the employer. And, um, and there's so many times that my academic union uh, was on strike, where we'd find members of my department of the philosophy department, the department that, you know, sees itself as the most logical and the best with arguments, um, claiming that they, you know, they're, that they were above politics because of logic and that, you know, and that they were the arbiter of thinking and they would say things that were completely contradictory that they couldn't even like parse what was politically happening, but they just assumed because they were studying logic or the philosophy of math, the philosophy of science or what have you, um, that they were somehow outside of any commitment to partisan struggle and yet at the same time, what they were replicating was the arguments of the university, right? They're the very invested arguments of the neoliberal university. Um, so my point here is believing that, you know, philosophy's history as the arbiter of thinking, I meant that they themselves were beyond class struggle. They ended up spontaneously replicating neoliberal political arguments without realizing that they were doing this in order to justify their self-interest. And they, at this point, they couldn't even meaningfully interpret the world in which they existed. They could give no meaningful interpretation to what was going on beyond what like propaganda was being written uh, by, by local newspapers. So moving on to this question then, we, we need to talk about 
philosophical principles, right? <clears throat> if philosophy is also a partisan uh, practice, then what does it mean to consciously practice philosophy according to a partisan politics? And I think this is a question that when we get through all the idea of what is philosophy and what is Marxist philosophy, the question, and I started this at the beginning that, I, that, I'm, that I'm concerned with that flows meaningfully from these two questions is, is what it means to practice that, right? What it means to practice philosophers, philosophy is someone that's trained in philosophy or someone that's collectively trained in studying philosophy, or what does it mean to do that when we bring it into kind of a group setting or organizational setting? And we know, and one of the things is that is that we know that liberal and reactionary partisan politics enlist their own ideologues to mobilize arguments and rhetoric. Very common thing, right? And so, and, and while some of these ideologues are consciously committed partisans, you can find some of these uh, philosophers uh, who, who definitely, or, or people that, you know, are other kind of intellectuals in academia who, who see themselves very dedicated to a certain political order. Um, there are other philosophers who imagine they are outside of class struggle, as I kind of mentioned above, but people like that, they, they, they end up being spontaneously enlisted to defend some strain of dominant ideology. The tools of critical th thinking taught in philosophy departments uh, do not in themselves allow for a demystifying of dominant ideology as much as some progressives believe that all you need is a good argument and a proper understanding of the rules of logic to understand the world correctly. Like, and I understand this, I, I teach critical thinking courses where we, we talk about like, what is an argument? What is critical thinking? We you know, do a bit of like formal logic, a little bit of informal logic, and we try to connect it to main issues. And one of the things that I always try to like, you know, that I, that I always try to like kind of push against because a lot of these textbooks preach it is that these tools in themselves are not going to teach you necessarily the reality of the world. They're, they're, they're not neutral because the people using them, you yourself may come committed to certain class politics. And even though we teach people to kind of suspend their own, you know, their own, their own, their own internal previous thoughts and to examine their lives according to the Socratic method, Ideology is such that without actually thinking through ideology, these, these tools in themselves, um, they, they, they just become tools uh, that end up being directed by what other kind of position you don't even realize that you're committed to because you treat it as common sense to begin with. Um, and so this notion that the failure to understand the correct position is merely a failure to be a, a proper critical thinker, it's undermined by the Western canon itself. I mean, just the, what I'm saying here is like, there's a good empirical response to that. Just go look at all of the great philosophers that have been canonized, right? And look at how many of them, despite the, the work they provided that we could learn from and draw from, but how many of them were consciously or unconsciously ideologues of the ruling ideas of the ruling classes of their times? What have they defended explicitly or implicitly, right? What they have done has contributed to the ideological, ideological strength of the state of affairs, but also that's part of the canon. And, and it's not, it's pretty easy to find examples of this. I mean, let, let's just look at like kind of the, 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 the ancients, right? Look at, look at Aristotle. Aristotle, I think there's lots of stuff I think that is worth learning from Aristotle. And you can't deny that Aristotle, even though it was a long time ago, kind of his important notion about some of the stuff about reason that he set in motion, even though it was quite wonky, um, <laughs> is, was very important for the development of thought. Yet at the same time, you read his politics and it's just a justification of an aristocratic, uh, aristocratic political order of his time, put forward using the, the tools of logic and reason that he used at his time, right? And you find this with so many philosophers all the way through. Uh, you know, Hobbes, I mentioned earlier as well. We can think of, of many of them. And then the idea that, um, that, uh, that all these people in the canon, so many of them were ideologues of, of the state of affairs of their time, shows that it's just not enough to like understand this kind of critical thinking to give you this ability to almost transcend partisan politics, right? A political decision kind of conditions all of that to begin with. Therefore, what I'm trying to say here is that I think philosophy as, as a practice of thinking thought or logically clarifying thoughts provides important resources to revolutionary movements invested in transforming the world. And these resources are useful though, in, in the same way they've been useful to the political orders that have been and are dominant. They are useful insofar as they are consciously put in the service of revolutionary movements. And I want to emphasize the conscious aspect of the service. Um, 
because you know earlier I talked about how uh, philosophers can be enlisted either consciously or unconsciously. They can be spontaneously enlisted by the dominant order, but when it comes to kind of a counter hegemonic order or movements that are challenging the state of affairs. Um, those movements are such, they don't kind of control the dominant view of, of the world. They're not going to be able to spontaneously enlist people, right? It requires almost this conscious commitment. The, the, the philosophical part is dedicated to those orders are done consciously so, because these, these, these movements don't have the power to spontaneously enlist people. Um, and this is because, again, revolutionary movements are challenging the state of affairs. Their ideology is largely not dominant or even close to becoming common sense. Individual philosophers can and will become spontaneous defenders of the status quo because the ruling ideas of the ruling classes are the dominant ideology. That is the way the world is seen as normal and natural. Uh, centuries of ideologues consciously making arguments for the correctness of various strains of bourgeois ideology, to be clear, is, is what has contributed alongside the bourgeois, you know, not just alongside, but, you know, it's contributed, you know, uh, in, in buttressing or coming alongside and supporting the fact that underneath all of this, the bourgeois class was taking power and reshaping reality in its image. And what this leads to is, you know, a normalization or naturalization of capitalist ide ideology. Or I, I should say here ideologies, because there are contradictory elements to capitalist ideology based on different wings of the bourgeoisie. And, and one of the, the signs that these variations of capitalist ideology possess such compelling power is that individuals can accept them as correct even when there are inherent contradictions to them and, and, and find ways to overcome those inherent contradictions. And that is the contemporary bourgeois order can generate spontaneous ideologues quite easily. getting a little bit off track here. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of, just to give us an idea of what we're talking about is how the evolutionary order or any other order in the past, right? You saw them bringing it in and helped under the command of those political movements to make that order hegemonic. I mean, what I'm suggesting here is we should learn from how those ideologues did things consciously in, in service to this kind of politics, um, the form of what they did, definitely not the content, right? And, and just learn something from it. In the same way that Gramsci once said that, you know, um, in Italy, that revolutionaries should learn from the Catholic Church, not because he liked the Catholic Church, but he said they've been around for hundreds of years, so they know how to like kind of perpetuate hegemony. So like, what are they doing? It's structurally. Okay, so when I say we need to kind of, you know, learn from these conscious ideologues, one that I always, here's a good example that I always bring up with, um, with students and comrades we're talking to, and, and, and I, I say that we should study him uh, critically, uh, is, is J.S. Mill, right? Um, and again, not because I think we should agree with Mill's politics. I don't at all. Maybe some people do, and we can have a discussion about that. But, you know, I, I definitely find Mill's politics completely, you know, opposed to a socialist order. Um, but the reason he's worth studying is because he is paradigmatic of a philosopher who was a conscious ideologue for the partisan bourgeois politics that became hegemonic. Mills on, and mainly what I encourage studying is Mills on Liberty, right? Because it's a partisan bourgeois text that uses philosophical practice, you know, arguments, reasoning, and rigor to defend and justify the bourgeois order or a very particular notion of the bourgeois order of his time. Um, but you have to remind, be reminded that in, this text wasn't written in a vacuum, right? Like Mill was, you know, concretely involved in the bourgeois movements of his day, attacking old, like vestiges of the old monetarian, emerging proletarian movements, right? Uh, so that his philosophical interventions were concretely invested in naturalizing and normalizing key aspects of bourgeois ideology. And of course he masks his status as partisan ideologue in the, in, in the supposed neutral language of philosophical reason, but this is largely because he was a true believer in the bourgeois order. Here, I think moving from this kind of the idea of partisan practice and kind of think about practice, I, I wanna kind of like, you know, I'm getting kind of close to the end of my talk because I'm brushing over a lot of stuff, but I wanna think about just kind of just generally about, about practice, right? And, and philosophical practice, not just as partisan, but kind of what it means once we take on kind of a partisan stance. And, and in, in demarcation and demystification, I, I kind of use a, a, a kind of a, a word picture, a 
I don't even have a diagram <laughs> point, but more just kind of a way to categorize our, our way of thinking about this is I talk about kind of three spheres or three distinct fields of practice, uh, the concrete, the theoretical, and the philosophical. Now, for me in the way that I'm thinking about this, and again, this is just a rubric to try to think about how, how we practice philosophy. Uh, the concrete and theoretical spheres of practice are, are dialectically interlinked. And, and, you know, think here, Lenin's claim that without a revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement, but also think it's reversal. Without a revolutionary movement, there can be no revolutionary theory. And that is when we draw on Mao's conception of the mass line, we know that the concrete practice of organizing and making revolution requires theoretical guidance learned from this concrete practice of going to the masses and coming back from the masses that is simultaneously theoretical guidance for the concrete practice. We learn theory from the movements that have come before us and distilled the theory gleaned from their concrete experiences through kind of collective revolutionary struggle. We develop theory through concrete organizational practice. Now, the philosophical sphere of practice is a bit different in that it functions as an interpretive gesture, right? As this practice of clarifying thoughts upon an already existing dialect dialectic between a theoretical and concrete. That is, it's uh, motivated by the political decision of being part of this dialectic, but uses its philosophical decision to help clarify sharpening and defending this kind of theoretical concrete dialectic, kind of to, to cut in and kind of like provide these tools of clarity and thinking to, to movements involved in kind of theorizing their struggle in the world. And, and to be less formalistic than this, um, It's always hard to represent something formalistic that I understand. Persons should dedicate themselves to these movements and place their skills in service of these movements. And the general tools of philosophy should both be absorbed by partisans of revolutionary movements so that the clarity of critical thinking, you know, but a critical thinking consciously directed by partisan dedication helps to clarify, interpret, and justify revolutionary theory emerging from concrete struggle. I mean, you know, uh, like, like, let us look, I think, at, at some longstanding problems with revolutionary movements that philosophical practice as a collective partisan practice can help with. And what I mean here is, is, is the problems of dogmatism and eclecticism. And I think most of us know that, you know, dogmatism is a serious, can be a serious problem with revolutionary theory. And it comes, I think, from a legitimate desire to protect revolutionary theory from dilution, right? This idea that, oh, well, we can't, except anything new and strange, because look, we have this theory that has proved itself useful, we must protect it at all costs from being like deproletarianized or something. But this legitimate desire, as we know, and we can look at the whole history of like revolutionary movements have examples of this, it can turn into a religious attitude to revolutionary theory that takes us away from scientific thinking. And philosophical rigor is useful here, because it can help us to clarify thinking, I clarify these questions of when, what dogmatism is, when it comes into account, how we can think through it, and it contributes to a critical thought that is opposed to dogmatism, right? At the same time, the eclecticism that results from a desire to seek out new and in interesting theories can be reined in by a proper philosophical practice, you know, the kind of philosophical practice invested in a partisan politics that asks, asks us to truly think through the worthiness of new and different approaches uh, kind of the sober minded in, in its thinking of thought. And, and the overall point I'm making is, is that philosophical practice is a resource, but only if it is in service to a partisan politics. And in the service is something that can be transformed into a collective skill set. So I kind of want to end on a, just this, this final point. It's like, I'm kind of ended by one, I kind of want to make final point is, is is that it's just to, it's just to, well, it's not, it's a point I've already made, but I wanna like re-emphasize it, or make it more explicit, is that I think philosophical practice must be something that is not only partisan, but also a collective uh, practice. You know, individual philosophers are not enough. Now, like we know that aside from individual philosophers, I think it's more also as a collective practice, um, we need to draw on people, philosophies and philosophers who come from kind of marginalized traditions and positions from like, you know, oppressed and exploited backgrounds. I think that's, that's very important, but even, it's, even if they're separate as individuals and not part of a collective movement, 
that contribution ends up not being enough to kind of what a philosophical partisan practice can be. Because while it is indeed the case uh, that, you know, individual philosophers who come from backgrounds with perspectives we need to learn from, and that they, 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 their work should be prioritized in a way, their prioritization matters the most only if they are part of a revolutionary movement. And the appeal to such individuals delinked from such movement is, is a genetic fallacy. Uh, that what I'm saying here is simply because a would-be philosopher comes from an exploited and oppressed background outside of this partisan structure, it doesn't necessarily mean they will easily escape becoming a partisan ideologue for dominant ideology, right? Spontaneously enlisted or even consciously enlisted. And Marx understood this in the third volume of Capital. Here's like a quote from that. He said, quote, the way that the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages built its hierarchy out of the best brains of the nation without regard to status, birth or wealth, was likewise a major means of reinforcing the rule of the priests and suppressing the laity. The more a dominant class is able to absorb the best people from the dominated classes, the more solid and dangerous its rule." End quote. So I just want to conclude with that insight, which is an insight about how the dominant class absorbs thinkers from every class, which should tell us, I think, uh, you know, kind of like open up this kind of discussion about why we need to build a movement that finds these thinkers, finds philosophies, fault philosophers, and makes them our thinkers. So at the end of the day, just to summarize everything out, revolutionary philosophical practice is about defending revolutionary theory and practice, thinking and clarifying its thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. That's all I give. A round of applause to our lecturer for today. Uh, we really appreciated the lecture. And you know, a lot of the points were things we have been talking about for a while in our attempts to, you know, change how a lot of us view philosophy since we admit as well that we tend to get stuck in our own uh, bourgeois tendencies. So it's really important. And I think this lecture has been enlightening for all of us. So now we move on to the next part of our program where we'll be opening the floor uh, to questions. So if anyone wants to ask anything, you can send your questions through our chat or you can use the raise hand button. If you want to open your microphones, please wait for me to call on you before you open so that uh, we can ask the questions correctly and we can have a nice flow. So I believe a few of our participants are still going to be formulating their questions. Uh, sir, I'd like to ask, what are we doing wrong, at least in terms of the academe, uh, in terms of how we are addressing these dominant ideologies? And what can we do more in order to make philosophy actually in service of the struggle? How do we demystify philosophy for the sake of uh, improving how we think about it. Well, I, I don't think I can answer about that question about what we are doing wrong by providing something about what we do right. I mean, I've, I've suggested a way forward of why, how I think philosophers who have um, embedded themselves in concrete movements, how they have acted and, and where they have gone wrong. Um, and I, I, can, I can only suggest kind of based on things on, on my own experience in my, in my own context. I think there's a lot of, you know, examples of philosophers who have put themselves, uh, you know, in, in uh, under the command of, of partisan movements and um, their skills under the command of those movements. And there are those that have done it and walked away from it and, and, and vice versa. I, I think that that really is, is what it has to do. I think that there, there is, there's, this is, this is also maybe a log standing problem with academia, right? And philosophy being, you know, as I pointed out, one of the oldest kind of, uh, you know, the oldest discipline that all the, the so many disciplines come from, from the notion of the scholastic enterprise, not scholastic as his name sometimes meant sometimes in philosophy, but the kind of the older term of the word, and 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 that's kind of the idea that we we are taught kind of to be um, as if as if we are are above the struggle or have uh, you know or can or can talk with authority down to the struggle rather than learning it. And that we have this kind of um, um, special individuality, and a lot of this is now because of bourgeois ideology, kind of emphasizing how you know important we are as individuals, and that like our individual command of reason um, puts us above things. And so, I think I think that the way to do anything right as philosophers or 
any or have you have any other skills that if you are interested in social collective revolutionary enterprise and surrender yourself to collective authority and put your skills in use of that and 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 try to like movements regard here's some skills that are useful while knowing you can learn from the people that you're you're bringing these skills to as well um and that's kind of i think the only solution to this problem is is, is making is the idea that you your philosophical practice ends up becoming one that is pulled into a movement and placed in service of a movement. Now, of course, that then becomes the other question is what movement is that, right? And um, and that's different in every social context. And I don't want to encourage any red tagging of anyone there, but if anyone knows anything about me, they know what I support in the Philippines. <laughs> I would say there, but I will not say anything beyond that publicly knowing uh, what that means publicly. Uh, thank you. So, uh, here's another question from uh, another participant. We posit that Marxism forms forwards a grand narrative that is oftentimes thought of as unchanging as well. However, this notion overlooks the dynamic philosophical foundation of dialectical materialism. How did this unchanging grand narrative notion start? How could you explain that this is not true in a succinct manner? And how does you, this connect can you, sorry, to our so can, can you start? Can you start from the beginning again? I missed the I missed the beginning of that question because the mic cut out. Many posit that Marxism forwards a grand narrative that is oftentimes thought of as unchanging as well. However, this notion overlooks the dynamic philosophical foundation of dialectical materialism. How did this unchanging grand narrative notion of Marxism as well? I was taught this both because. In, two things were happening when I went through my undergrad. First, in the analytic tradition, which um, decided, except for a few people, like a lot of stuff in philosophy, it's still, it's, it's underlying politics and it's underlying political decision, even when it didn't admit it was liberalism and was anti-Marxist. Not that what it was doing was necessarily always anti-Marxist, but the people teaching it were anti-Marxist. And so they would say this shit about Marxism, right? And then, and then, the, and, and then the second one is that whenever I would take these kind of courses where you would learn kind of stuff in the continental tradition that was popular at that time, like the post-structuralists. Um, they were saying the same stuff, right? They were saying, they were the ones using the term grand narrative and all see that's from this Foucauldian uh, stuff. I mean, he starts, he's talking about this in, 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 in Nietzsche, you know, Nietzsche genealogy and history. And, and this becomes this kind of way of talking about things. And a lot of it is just, I think, very, very bad and simplistic understanding of Marxism, or at the very best, it's because there are vulgar Marxists that emerged in certain period of times that did present that in a certain way. Certain Marxists who would speak with this kind of teleological language, right? And this kind of, all, all, that, all that kind of stuff, right? And, and I want to suggest that it's like, if you actually study the Marxist tradition in, in this kind of critical way, and not, not just as someone as, as a critical Marxist that rejects so-called orthodox Marxism, but if you look at kind of the major revolutionary movements from Marx to like Lenin to Mao and all this, you see what you see instead is kind of a, this rejection of this, even sometimes these thinkers will use teleological language because they're, they're speeches, they're in the moment. They think that like the revolution is gonna win. There's like this, something like that, right? But if you actually look at all the other stuff they're saying, it's not about this, it's almost this, there's, there's these moments that it can be socialism or barbarism, right? Teleology, and then you have these moments where like, there's, there's like these, these shifts, those moments of, of continuity and rupture that happen where suddenly you have different insights that come and reorganize and reject certain things of previous areas of Marxism and like, and bring new insights to the table and there's like struggle around it and all that kind of stuff. So when you look at that kind of development of theory and kind of the excitement of theory and debates that are happening within it, it's, it's hard to suddenly say that it's just this grand narrative. And I, I definitely think, yes, um, the practice of, of, of dialectics and dialectical thinking, which is something that, you know, it's an analytic I was taught was bad, but um, it's a different type of logic from analytic logic. It's not opposed to it different, but this idea of thinking about these contradictions in a different way, antagonistic contradictions function. I think it's very useful in thinking through this project to get away from this notion that is depicted as some kind of grand teleological narrative. And that's, I, I have a lot more to say about that because I've written about that elsewhere and things like that, but I think it'd be kind of my general summary of it. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, again, here's another question from the chat. How should we Marxists deal with ontological questions? Should we adopt 
and the Temptrifine a dialectical materialist ontology in order to be properly called Marxists. This is in reference to those who in the present attempt to refine Diamat, Lao Tzu, or Badiou to some extent. Yeah, I think this is what I would call, and this is this is my position, and I'll, I'll defend this because it's one of the things I argue with. I think this is occultation, right? I think dialectical materialism and the way that Marx and Engels understood it was not as another ontology qua ontology, right? It wasn't to build this speculative theology underneath things. It was instead, you know, that, that's, that's, that's Hegel, right? That's the logic. But it was instead to take the logic that's in there, dialectical logic, and use it to think through historical materialism or think through the fact of materialism, right? It's important that there still is theory and this kind of dialectics, but finding this kind of underarching ontology that builds kind of a reality scaffolding. I think that takes us away from Marxism and that mystifies stuff again. And this is, as much as I love Bajou in some aspects, I don't really like Zizek that much. I find him kind of a clown. Um, I always I always joke that with, with friends that in any book of Zizek, it's kind of got a ratio of like one to 10 of like good to crappy. So if you have a, if you have a, if you have a 300 page book by Zizek, you can find probably 30 good pages in there, but most of it is like stuff I, I find just kind of clownish. That's just me. Um, I know friends that like G. Jack will disagree with me on that. But the Jew is someone I do have some kind of sympathy with because of his past as someone involved in revolutionary projects before kind of the collapse of those projects and him moving into this kind of post-Marxist milieu. And, and some of the stuff he wrote back in his more revolutionary period was interesting and, and useful. But then he moved in, he moves into this ontology qua ontology. I use, I use ontology qua ontology because I still think there's things that say analytic philosophy defines as ontological questions that isn't the same kind of speculative theology anymore, right? But, um, but you know, Baju moves into this idea to kind of provide kind of the scaffolding of being, even though, he, even though he claims that's the business of math, it ends up being this kind of Neoplatonism and a bunch of like set theory and then later categorical theory and logics of worlds. I mean, interesting stuff to read, um, but I feel it still occults things away from stuff. And I feel that like, there's old the old kind of Soviet way of saying things, despite all its problems. They made this discussion of kind of like you have you have historical materialism and you have dialectical materialism. The, the schematism is also bad because it's good in some ways, but it's also bad. And the badness comes from its uh, how it's kind of based on that first interpretation of philosophers only interpreted the world. The point is to change it, where they where they kind of like you know say you know philosophy is done. Instead, we got science right and. Um, and so, you know, it's uh, the, the way that though that the division happens is look, there's there's this the, the science of history, if we want to call it, you know, there's all these the older definition of the term science is historical materialism and dialectical materialism is the philosophy that you know makes us kind of think through the problems of this. It's, it's second order, right? It's a way of kind of thinking through and understanding historical materialism. It's not the ontological foundations of reality itself. Now, I realize you can find a bit of that in like angles, right, in dialectic of nature, but it depends on how you read dialectics of nature. And also we must remember that Engels was unhappy with dialectics of nature and chose to not have it published, which should tell us something about the limitations and the fact that it's rough notes. Okay, that's a, I know there's a lot there, but again, I, I talk about that in a lot more detail in, in, in demarcation and demystification. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for your uh, Here's another question uh, from another participant. Do you have any suggestions on how we can engage and introduce Marxist philosophy to a religious community? Since the Philippines is heavily influenced by Catholicism, which sometimes tends to preach, you know, maintaining the status quo and such, what should we take note? Was it interesting question for me? I mean, this is the Easter weekend. Right? For me, it's still like Easter. It's Sunday, right? Um, and my wife's family is like her extended family is is, is Catholic, and um, you know they're Palestinian Catholic, and the big um, kind of events and things with them as well. Um, but also, it's like you know I, I grew up um, with you know kind of a religious family around me and a kind of a church kind of position, and my and my parents were like progressive Christians. Despite the fact, I would say they're, they're social democrats, and I definitely 
<laughs> and now this kind of communist that's uh but they're still they're still sympathetic with me but you know we have our arguments about that so I understand that and I understand how to argue with people that are religious and I, I think there's a value in that um my, my 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 main thing is that I always you know, I, I, it was interesting is like, I, I had this whole discussion about this. There's a, there's a blog called Faith and Capital and it's by um, kind of a US Christian, but a communist um, and one that like goes more into the MLM realm, but had, draws a lot from liberation theology. And he had me on once and we had a kind of discussion about it. I don't you know, obviously agree with him on a lot of things, but it, it's in, interesting to see the way that he's thinking through things. And also the idea of trying to draw in people from, kind of religious backgrounds. And, you know, for me, the question always was, is that despite the arguments about God and all those kind of questions, it's like, it's like, where, where do you draw the antagonistic line with society? Like if you are in, this is one of the things on earth. So like our, the community here is more important. I'm like, that's bullshit. I said, <laughs> the important is, is that if you are going to be radical and still keep your, your, your religion in that, you should be realizing that the general antagonism here matters, right? And that you should not be, you know, like if you really care about your progressive politics, you shouldn't be in community with a reactionary, right? Um, th they should be seen as in the same way that you know, look at like kind of the the um, the radical black church during the civil rights movement in the U.S., right? They would not be in community with white supremacists. <laughs> End of story, right? And that's even that's not even the most radical aspects of that community. So I think for me, it's, it's the question is, is engaging with religious kind of people is like, see where they draw the line of the general antagonism, right? Do they draw it? Um, do they just, is their politics just on paper and they can have a nice debate with their friends that like, you know, want to support all these heinous things in reality, right? Um, and, and that those people are their friends at the end of the day because of Christianity, Catholicism, whatever. Um, and, or, or do they actually say that line matters? And then in terms of like kind of thinking ways to like think about that, I mean, there's, you know, there's a broad history of liberation theology. There is, which is the way, you know, sees like certain passages of the social gospel as ones where like are, are quite antagonistic to, to people that are wealth, wealthy landowners, rentiers and things like that. And that's where you, that's where you find the position to argue with people about that. Like what, what Jesus are they talking about? Uh, thank you. Uh, again, here's another question. Uh, we're going to be moving more towards uh, the sciences. So since Marxism is based on materialism, uh, it has a, a, it recognizes the role of science as the basis of our thought. And so we see that it is the scientific approach to use dialectical materialism to you know, to analyze the world, to try to understand society. How do we connect, you know, philosophy and science in general uh, for Marxism? And how do we use it uh, in society today uh, as we try to reach, you know, a more socialist and more communist society? Well, I think one of the ways that we, as Marxist philosophers, that we think about science, I mean, we can talk about, you know, historical materialism being the science of history, the best version of the science of history of the social sciences. And we start looking at the other fields of science, which are different fields of science, right? Like the, the so-called natural or hard sciences have their own rules that, you know, are very discrete physics, biology, chemistry, things like that. Um, I think one of the things that we should look at is, is the way that um, science is always one that is also practiced the people that practice science come from class positions as well. Now, this doesn't mean that what they're practicing is some kind of like they're definitely not going down that road that um, some weird kind of post-structuralist thinkers think about science, where it's almost like it's all just power in itself. It has no more truth than art and all that kind of stuff. I and mean, then bullshit. We can see that's not true because there are certain things that work. I mean, whenever anyone says that to me, I'm like, OK, look, um, if, I, if you want to have brain surgery, are you going to go to someone that's trained as a brain surgeon? Are you going to go to some guy in his, like, his house down the street in his garage that says that he's like looked in a manual and is convinced that he's a brain surgeon? You know who you're going to, right? And we also know that we have instruments that have been derived out of this practice of science. Now, that's one thing, right? So rejecting this kind of um, 
relativist notion, completely relativist notion of science as, as, as not being anything meaningful, but just power, we should do that, right? We should reject that notion. But at the same time, we can't take on this unqualified scientism that just imagines scientific pursuit happened outside of real political commitments and class struggle. We know, for example, just look at, at the history of, of vaccines, not the ones, you know, not that they don't work, but how whether, whether, whether did research happen on them? They happen by experimenting on the most oppressed members of society, right? Those are real kind of class commitments that happen and something that's completely gross about that. And the fact that scientists and science, sciences aren't outside of the stuff where all of the stuff they study can't be used in monstrous ways or have developed through monstrous aspects. These are things we need to critique. And a really kind of liberatory practice of science would, you know, scientists who don't have philosophical training, they often end up like doing spontaneous philosophy um, while thinking they're above philosophy. And so they tend to interpret what they're doing according to philosophical categories. Um, and they give them this great meaning or great ontological meaning and, 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 and they appeal to ethics and all this kind of stuff, but they do it without the training of a philosopher because, they, because that's the way they try to conceptualize their work. And he talks about kind of the interaction between that. And that's kind of an important. Someone wants to learn more about Marxism without it being too difficult for beginners. Mm. <laughs> That is, you know, I mean, I think some of the classic texts are useful. And I always kind of think about, um, you know, Engels, uh, you know, socialism, scientific or utopian, right? Is a great piece, very simple, very short, kind of gives you the notion of, of the basic conceptions of, of historical materialism. Um, and then I think there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of um, you know, revolutionary parties the world over have like made kind of study texts of, of basic ones. There's one that the Communist Party of the Philippines <laughs> has made um, that is like a basic study text and very short and, and Foreign Languages Press puts out a, a copy of that. There's also, you know, study texts that were put out by the Indians and things like that. And they're very useful beginnings um, for uh, like just what is the ins and outs of how we understand historical materialism. I mean, as such, they're, they're like textbooks, right? They're, they're textbook guides, this kind of stuff. And so they're very good, useful kind of ways in. Um, you know, some others that, I, that have been good, but still need updating. I think we need a lot of updating from some of the classic ones uh, that are for, for lay learners is the, you know, the Chinese Communist Party back at the height of the revolution in China put out the, uh, the, the Shanghai textbook or the fundamentals of political economy. Um, it's kind of weird. It's, it's very, some of its examples are completely outdated and show its kind of cultural period in that, but it does actually give still a really good kind of uh, uh, lay person understanding of political economy, like quite easy understanding of political economy. You just got to kind of separate yourself from the wonky 1960s references that are happening in it. Um, and I think that's that's what I would say for kind of basic basic ways in. Well, thank you, sir. I think we'll have two more questions before we end our open forum. So here's another one. I just wanted to hear the speaker's thoughts on how to reconcile queer theory, generally post-structuralist, with Marxism and how to relate Marxist with queer liberation. I mean, this is one I've thought about a lot, not, not because you know I have a lot of a lot of a lot of work that has emerged of queer theory has been really good, and I think you know Jasper Poor, uh, like I, I appreciate a lot of her work, even where I disagree with it. Um, I think the one of the problems I have with what gets called queer theory, there's a lot of things under queer theory. So like that's that's almost saying like how do I reconcile sociology <laughs> with like Marxism or something? I mean, but smaller because there's there's so many things that are now grouped under queer theory that are actually quite antagonistic to each other in terms of politics. Like you can look at say, Jasper Poor's work in terrorist assemblages and, and the right to Maine, which I think is her best work right now and, and in contradiction with so much other work that she even, she even calls out in terrorist assemblages is defending um, the neoliberal society. So, so it's, it's just a lot of stuff in queer theory, but I mean, you're right about the fact that the stuff that's trying to study queerness in general has a post-structuralist base. But I think we can use historical materialism to show why it has that. And one of the reasons it has this is because 
the problem, the, the issue of uh, LGBTQ struggles and all these things were happening right when in a period where the socialist movement was splintering worldwide and declining and wasn't able to provide an accurate analysis of this. And at the same time, there was a rise of post-structuralism in academia. This is not to say questions of, 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 of queer, you know, that queer theory takes on were not addressed by historical materialists before that. There is, you know, the great um, Los Angeles reading group, uh, which was a, you know, a, a, a lesbian organization in, in the 70s. They, they attacked some of the anti-revisionist groups in the USA for, for their homophobia. And they, they wrote a whole bunch of stuff that is kind of early forms of a historical materialist queer theory that is worth examining. Uh, Sojourner Truth Organization did the same thing with, with they were another anti-revisionist group in the US at that time. So we have the seeds of that. The issue is, is that, um, you know, when these questions became paramount because of, of queer movements suddenly, you know, actually carrying forward their struggles in these concrete areas, you know, fighting against the police in Stonewall, ACT UP, all this kind of stuff that's happening. Um, you have, you have the, the, the socialist movement worldwide in decline, um, being fractured, uh, falling apart, and a new kind of, within academia where queer theory really kind of grows, you have like kind of post-structuralism appearing as the, as the antidote to, to the supposed errors of historical materialism. So a lot of people who want to talk about this in academia, what are they going to refer to primarily? They're going to refer to what, what is the chic theory of that time, right, to speak about these kinds of things. Now, at the same time, I feel that there's a number of radical thinkers who do queer theory um, are starting to realize the importance of historical materialism. So social text back about a year ago, so early 2021, they put out a, a um, it's worth getting and looking at this, they put out a, 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 a special journal issue that was edited by Jasper Poor and Petrus Liu, both really big names in queer theory, and it was called Left of Queer. And in it, they argue about getting beyond this kind of former antagonism between Marxism and queer theory. And that in fact, it's important to understand these things as connected as a possible notion of getting further left of where queer theory has ended up today. And, um, and I can't speak too much to Jasper. I have, I have certain kind of suspicions about where, where, where Jasper has gone. Like I, I know I've had interactions with her um, online, so I don't know her in person, but I, I have a friend who's like one of her students, who's, who's a Maoist, who's one of her students and has told me that, you know, Jasper has become over time more interested in like kind of Marxism and, and Lenin and Lenin and things like that recently because of her on the ground work with kind of Palestinian self-determination. And you find that her work has become, in my mind at least, she might disagree with me, but I, like I'm seeing how from the switch from terrorist assemblages to the right to main, despite the fact that it still has this um, the post-structuralist background, it becomes more concrete and more like desires of like kind of materialist understanding of things. And then in left of queers, attacks on academic freedom and red tagging have increased even more especially in our university, in the University of the Philippines, that has been, you know, labeled as the breeding ground of communists. How do we do revolutionary philosophy in this context? In the context where it's actually a danger to our lives, to a certain extent, to be revolutionary in our philosophy? Yeah, I mean, I can't really answer this question. And I'll tell you why. Like, I am in a situation in a, in a country that is at the centers of imperialism where so far I have the privilege to um, do this without being, without experiencing that kind of recrimination from the state. I mean, I, I still have experienced forms of, um, of, you know, like red tag, but they wouldn't result in the same problem, right? Like I, 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 I it'd be called like red baiting would be a more appropriate term for here where like, you know, my, you know, I, I'll be called out by something or, you know, called like a communist and that's meant to, to devalue the work that I'm doing because of the longstanding anti-communism here, but it's not the same as red tagging. Like my life isn't in danger, not yet anyhow. Um, it could, if organizational work gets stronger here, then it would be that. So I can't really, like, I think it's, I think it's, it would be unfair of me to give any kind of suggestion here because I'm not part of the mass movement there, even though I, I support it. And, and I understand that largely this happens because um, the movement has the strength as such that it's, there's like a general line of antagonism. The general antagonism has become between that, that movement um, and the state. 
right? And once it comes into that antagonism, of course, in every single situation, something like that red tagging is going to happen with academics. And abstractly, it's very easy, easy for me to say, well, if, you're part, if your politics is partisan, then you make a choice and you go join the movement or something like that, because that's what I would love to see myself doing here. But I can't make that call for people in a situation where I have no stakes in the matter, right? Like, I, have, I mean, I have the abstract states that I want to see communism happen everywhere, but it's not, it's not going to affect me. And I don't have the experience of that affecting me. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I, it might be cowardly for me to do this, but I just really think it would be unfair of me to say anything here because I, I don't, I, I'm in a position of kind of jet, like right now, at least right now of, of, of academic privilege to a certain extent. I mean, the worst thing that's happened to me because of my communism is that I'm not going to be probably getting tenure anytime soon, but I'm still able to find work. I'm not living in fear of my life, right? So we've seen a lot of questions. Uh, we covered a lot of ground there. Uh, a lot of our participants uh, mentioned subject areas that were a bit far from what we originally talked about, but you know, it was a very fruitful discussion. So again. Professor, we are so grateful that we had you for today, and I hope eventually we might have another opportunity like this. We'd also like to thank everyone who participated here today. Uh, we'll be sending our evaluation form in the chat as well as in your email, so please answer that. And alongside this, we'd also like to thank uh, our partner organizations who helped make this event possible. Philosophy Month 2022 has been brought to you by the Bicol University Young Philosophers Society, the League of Filipino Students, uh, CSSP, UP Kabataang Pilosopatasho, and Hilagio, the University of Santo Tomas Senior High School Philosophy Club. It's also in cooperation with La Societe, the De La Salle University Senior High School Philosophy Club, the Philippine Collegian, the Philosophical Society of Philippine Normal University Manila, and the UP Philosophy for Children Society.